When I was 25 and a half, I started a podcast. The goal? To review some of the newest and the latest movies, along with some other stuff. With the help of my guests, I was able to do this. But there were dark forces tampering with my podcast. And with me. They called it an improvised podcast for some reason. I eventually found help in the form of myself. Yes, the me from a universe where the movies I reviewed got delayed. Apparently, my podcast made it to his universe. I know now that it is my duty, for the good of that universe, nay, the multiverse, to keep recapping and reviewing these movies, to hold listeners over until they could eventually see the movies as they were made in their world. For some reason, they come out differently in my world, but it's kind of entertaining that way. My name is Steven Schinder, and this is Delayed Replay. Hello, listeners. Welcome to another exciting episode of Delayed Replay. Kind of a different one this time. I'm your host, as always, Stephen Schinder. And joining me for this particular special episode, you've heard him on the podcast back in season one, so it's great to have him back in season two. It is Zach Arnold from the Intergalactic Peace Coalition podcast. How are you, dude? Hey, man, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me back. I uh, had a really successful first season, and I'm honored to be invited back for the second season. This should be a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, season two has been kind of different because, like, it's kind of gone, like, a bit more, like, across seas. Like, I've had friends from, like, across the Atlantic on. That's been different, but it's also great to have familiar voices back every now and then. So glad to have you here. That's awesome. Congratulations on that. It's always nice to have that kind of diversity at your disposal. It just adds a nice little flair to the program and what you're trying to do. Yeah, for sure. So the topic for this one, uh, normally we talk about movies that got delayed in that other universe. Because that seems to be like the main difference between like our universes and, you know, the th- Thing that caused those movies to get delayed over there but right. apparently there are a few other differences at least so in our universe okay so some listeners may be familiar with the film space jam which oh, yeah of course you know it's the classic nostalgic like looney tunes playing basketball with michael jordan it sounds as wacky on paper as it looks on screen And basically, over in that other universe, it seems like they might have only had that one movie, and then, like, they tried doing a Space Jam 2 and a couple other spinoffs, but that never got off the ground, and so what they ended up with was only Looney Tunes back in action um, after, like, Spy Jam and Race Jam got cancelled, and also Skate Jam got cancelled as well what Um, yeah it's bizarre and like we have all those movies here as like we've recently rediscovered you're you're saying that the jam cinematic universe doesn't exist in that other universe yeah and like they're just barely like like in both our universes like this summer we're having space jam a new legacy but for them it seems like it's their first jam movie since the first one which is bizarre what like this this is almost like a soft reboot for us bringing the franchise back from its glory in the 90s and 2000s and you're saying that there hasn't been anything since michael jordan first appeared on the scene right well other than like looney tunes back in action which is kind of the same concept of like having looney tunes in live action but it's a totally different genre in itself like, right it, kind of like kind of a spin-off felt- almost yeah, like it felt like a sidestep to them, but for us, because we've had these other different like jam movies, it kind of feels a bit more in place. But like, okay, so here, like, here's a wild thing. So apparently, I have seen Space Jam two, you know, the one from 1999 in the theater, but I forgot about it. And here's why: because my friend Keon, uh, who's on the Trust Your Doctor, a Doctor Who podcast. He mentioned in one of their episodes, I think it was like 310 or something, that 
like Space Jam 2 had like a memory erasing feature at the end, which is why like some people kind of forgot about it immediately after seeing it. And so I guess it was kind of like a marketing thing where like, you know, moviegoers would go see it and then be like, oh, I'm not sure if I saw it. Let's, you know, pay to see it again. And then like uh, next next time another jam movie comes out, they'll be not sure if it, if they've seen a new one in a while. And then that's why you get like Spy Jam and Race Jam. Um, well, I guess Race Jam came after Looney Tunes back in action. I'd have to look at the film list again but yeah when back in action came out some people were like huh i'm not sure if i've seen a looney tunes live action movie in a while so they basically told it that and then they got skate jam later so yeah like people like thanks to the internet like people are like rediscovering like hey there are these jam movies that we kind of forgot about but they're totally there for us to watch. And so, like, now that people are aware of the memory erasing feature, they just blink when that, like, Men in Black style thing happens, you know? And it's like, yeah, they, this is a wild cinematic universe that they created. It's like the Men in Black franchise got a hold of the JCU, which is crazy. I mean, like, I bet you that other universe only has like three or four Men in Black movies while we got our 10 over here. Like, I, I just don't understand. Yeah, like, like we have MIB 23, you know, the Jump Street crossover with Men in Black, but apparently they don't have it over there. It's weird. What? I don't, I, I'll tell you this, I would not want to live in that universe. I don't think I could, I, could, I don't think I could be in a universe Universe that doesn't have a comprehensive men in black universe and doesn't have the jcu in it like what's the point of movies if you don't have like those two key cogs in cinema yeah i know it's like I, yeah i'm just glad that we have what we have but thankfully we're able to describe these movies to the people who don't have it in that other universe and like they come out differently well, some of them seem to come out differently over here in terms of, like, the story details. So it's kind of fun to, like, compare uh, what we got uh, and, like, how they got it. Like, just, it's weird how, like, the way they're made is very different between the two universes. Um, but, yeah, so let's just get into it. So I guess we'll start with our thoughts on the first Space Jam movie. Uh, so, what are your thoughts on the original from 1996? Oh, man. Where do I even begin? I mean, I was born in 93, so I basically kind of grew up with this movie. You know, it came out when I was about three three years old, and it was just something that we had in our house on a regular basis. You know, I don't know if we actually saw it in the theaters or not, but uh, I, I do recall having it on uh, on vhs i do remember upgrading to the disc when when those became more mainstream like it was just it was a part of of what we watched on a regular basis my brother was always really into cartoons and i was always really into sports and so that was kind of like the one movie where we could kind of come together you know and and that's part of why i'm grateful for the jcu as a whole is you know you get to have these adventures with uh, with the with the Looney Tunes on these different jam adventures, and I get to connect with my brother in different ways, and it all started with uh, with the first Space Jam movie. So uh, I'm I'm really grateful for it, and I always enjoy it when I get the chance to watch it. Yeah, like you, I had this in my house like for much of my childhood. I I still have the VHS um in a box over here. Oh somewhere, wow. But... Yeah, like, it was something that I watched a lot. Like, it, it was in constant rotation with the likes of, like, The Lion King and oh, other yeah. VHS classics I loved watching at the time. And it's it even got to a point where I vaguely remember telling family members to call me Michael Jordan, or, like, that's my nickname or whatever, even <laughs> though I, I did not, like, play basketball. And it's, like... I just loved the movie, and it's, I don't know, like, Michael Jordan was just fun to watch in that movie. I know people oh yeah, uh, here and there might say, uh, he, he's not really acting, but, like, I, there's just something about him That's that... That's the point! He doesn't <laughs> need to act! He can yeah. just be Michael Jordan and hang out with Bugs Bunny, and it works! Yeah, like, he seems very... 
I don't know what the word is, personable, maybe like he's able to interact with people very well and like bring them together. And it's like, yeah, you could play a game with him. Like it's, I don't know, but yeah. So that's the first movie. And then the, the second uh, movie space jam two, like apparently I saw it in the theater. Like it was one of the first ones I saw in the theater. Cause like Tarzan is the earliest one I remember yeah seeing and i think space jam 2 came out like that same summer so yeah that sounds about right yeah yeah some of some of my earliest memories of of movies in the theaters were were definitely tarzan and then i think chicken run came out in 2000 so like that late 90s early 2000s were were some of my my earliest memories so i have i have no doubt that if the first space jam was so popular in our household that we 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 probably most likely ended up seeing it in theaters but you know thanks to that memory erasing feature we may have forgotten that we even did that yeah (laughs) like imagine going into like the theater having popcorn and then like you go home you don't remember eating and it's like huh i need to use the toilet but i don't remember eating anything well can you can you imagine like like today people will go and watch a, a dc movie and they'll come out of it and be like oh it was so good and you know, and people were like going by you in the hallway, and they're asking, "How was it? How was it?" And you're like, "It was so good." And then you come out of of Race Jam, and people were like, "How was it? How was it?" And you're like, "I I I I don't remember." <laughs> like, did I watch a movie, or am I about to watch a movie? Like, that, that, yeah, that, just get back in line. <laughs> you just you just get back in line. You're like, why am I wandering around the lobby aimlessly? I came here to watch Space Jam too. Yeah. Also, I guess we should go into like where are your th- experiences with like the Looney Tunes in general. Like, were there like oh, any other geez. parts of like that whole franchise that you experienced and enjoyed, or maybe didn't enjoy so much? I don't know. Oh man, where to begin? I mean, Warner Brothers and and Looney Tunes have been part of my childhood for a long, long time because uh, growing up, like my family knew that Looney Tunes were quote unquote safe. You know, like, like <laughs> yeah, there's with a, all the explosives, and all the violence. explosives <laughs> and the gun violence and the, you know, Acme uh, dynamite blowing up in Wile E. Coyote's face. Like, yeah, totally safe. But like those types of cartoons were the ones that we watched the most. Like we had the like we had Boomerang and that kind of thing showing the, the throwback cartoons. And we would watch that more than Cartoon Network. And um, one summer, I want to say it was summer of 2000, Cartoon Network did this promotional special one time called June Bugs, where the whole weekend the channel got overtaken by nonstop consecutive back to back to back Bugs Bunny cartoons. Like, oh, wow. That was the entire programming for the whole weekend. And so we got like blank recordable video cassettes. And recorded like six or seven six hour editions of just nonstop Bugs Bunny. And we had that for as long as we had our VHS player, right up until we made the switch to DVD. We would watch those June Bug specials on a regular basis. Um and then a little bit later after I after I got older, we watched the uh, uh the Lunatics. You remember the Lunatics Unleashed? Oh, I unironically enjoyed the Lunatics. <laughs> I did too. It was like Justice League meets the uh, the Looney Tunes, and right. I thought it I thought it was cool. I was like, "Whoa, look at these guys! They're out there saving the city using their Looney Tunes technology. This is cool." No, I I genuinely thought that that show was going places, and then it only went like two seasons. Yeah, I remember. It came out, like, around the time that I got into the Teen Titans cartoon, which was the first DC cartoon that I really got into before, like, all the other DC stuff. And so, like, having them in the tower is like, oh, yeah, it's like Looney Tunes by way of Teen Titans. And, like, I think, yeah, I think it only lasted, like, two seasons. And, like, in the second season, they brought back more uh, villains that were or looked like uh some of the other looney tunes characters like elmer fudd was like this um i remember there was an episode where there was like a whole army of him and it looked like like it was basically like a wizard of 
Oh, wait. Actually, you know what? I'm getting that premise mixed up with Duck Dodgers. There was an episode where they basically, <laughs> um, it was like Duck Wizard Dodgers. of Oz. And they had to like sneak in and they're like, where'd you get this idea? And Porky or the character that's like Porky was like, either the Wizard of Oz. And so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Man, that's another blast from the past. I didn't watch as much Duck Dodgers, but I the, the ones that I did see, I really enjoyed. So... Yeah, I mean, like I said, there's there's basically been a lot of instances where, you know, the Looney Tunes or some iteration of it. I mean, I even remember my brother watching, uh, what was it, Baby Looney Tunes, when that was yeah. a thing. Like yeah, they were just I they, were, that. they were like they were like little Looney Tune characters at a at a daycare or something like that. Yeah, basically. like Granny was taking care of all of them and somehow, like, because Sylvester and Tweety are little babies, they get along very well. So, so, so trippy. So, so weird. Like, that was that was the one that I was just like, ah, I don't know if I can get on board with this. But just about everything else I really enjoyed. Yeah, like, Baby Looney Tunes was kind of just a comfort watch. Like, eh, nothing's on. I'll just put this on. Like, it was basically that for me. Yeah. Um, I think, I I think in the '90s, like, like in my household, we had uh, I think a couple VHS tapes that had some of the older Looney Tunes cartoons. I don't know like what decade or what, but basically gave me uh, the idea of like what it's all like. Like there are some Wiley e. Coyote and Roadrunner stuff as well. And uh, as I grew older, I found that I wasn't that into, like, well, so as a kid, um, like, you know, I loved Bugs Bunny. I even had, like, a stuffed animal rabbit named after him, even though I considered the stuffed animal a uh, female. But, um, like, as I grew older, the, the running gags of just the predictability of the violence and the repetitiveness of it, I kind of got to a point where I got tired of seeing all of that, like not just in Looney Tunes, but also in Tom and Jerry. So with those types of things, I find that my favorite parts of those franchises, like of that and like Scooby-Doo are like the mm -hmm. installments that kind of go against the grain. And so for the Looney Tunes franchise, my favorite show uh, of that whole thing is, um, the Looney Tunes show from the like early 2010s where they're basically living in like the suburbs and it's kind of like a sitcom and it just kind of reminded me of Seinfeld which I was really into and so like I was kind of into that whole vibe of it and yeah, that's yeah. Fair. I've, I've always enjoyed sitcoms but I think by the time the early 2010s came around I was like entering high school and starting to think oh I'm too cool for Looney Tunes and so <laughs> like my my attention kind of shifted to other things at that time but it's funny how you kind of come back around to your childhood by the time you reach your 20s or so and you start thinking about all those good times and you're like why did i ever stop watching this like like warner having the the the, the looney tunes shows and looney tunes episodes available online now uh is just it's like a nostalgia trip anytime I want it and it's extremely dangerous because I can just keep browsing for like episodes that I remember from my childhood and be like oh I remember this one oh, oh, oh I remember this one and the next thing you know like five hours have passed yeah like you get the older stuff as well as some of the newer stuff on HBO Max so it's it's nice that they're all there in one place or at least have like a huge collection of the stuff so that's pretty cool um so yeah, with Space Jam. Um, so Zach, do you you play sports, right? Or you've watched sports like <laughs> <laughs> a little bit here and there, dabbled in it from time to time. Um, I played I played basketball in high school, and then I worked in my university's athletics office for about four years while I was working on my bachelor's and my master's degree. So. I've been around just about everything. Tennis, basketball, baseball, softball, golf, volleyball. Uh, I've watched stuff like uh, cricket and lacrosse and rugby. Um, never played anything more than like baseball or, or basketball, but I've been around the sports world a time or two, yeah. 
Yeah, the only... So between 6th and 7th grade, I think it was, that was when I uh, joined like a summer basketball league, pretty much because my family kind of pushed me into trying it. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of whatever to me. Uh, was, like after it was done, I was like, yeah, I'm never doing that again. Like my brother was more of the sports fan, especially he especially loved playing basketball. So that was like more his speed, I guess. He's still like watches the Lakers from time to time, I think. And, like, the only sports games I really went to were, like, in college when I would, like, cheer on uh, Anteater Quidditch uh, at my school, UC Irvine. It, like, oh, is yeah, the Quidditch the Eaters. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, so in the first Space Jam movie, it, it's kind of, it kind of has the distinction of, like, showcasing three different sports and that you got michael jordan playing basketball and baseball and also golf so you kind of have like a little trifecta there i guess mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this is true uh i don't know which one he was best at though if i'm being honest i mean he did get a hole in one in golf in the first movie so yeah I mean, but that was like due to like the magnet that bugs had under the ground right it was kind of helping no, him with that you, you don't know that maybe he just got lucky <laughs> Sorry. So we get to Space Jam 2, and this wouldn't have happened if Michael Jordan hadn't agreed to come back for it. So it's great that he came back for it, but you can also tell from time to time that he seems a little over it. Like, it, it kind of helps yeah. that his character in the movie is, like, supposed to be washed up and is thinking of, like, retiring from basketball again. but. It kind of took me out of the universe from time to time, seeing how washed up he seemed like he really was in the movie sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I, I can only imagine how big of a payday he must have gotten to come back to this franchise. And that must have been his only motivation for it. Like, he was decent in the first movie, but you could really tell how much he was phoning it in in this one. Like, he was just going through the motions, what motions he was able to go through. And it, it was it was just a little choppier, I guess. Like, his motions weren't as fluid, and, you know, his, his extensions didn't feel quite the, as magical as when he extended for that game-winning slam dunk against the Monstars. Like, there just, there wasn't that, that sparkle that was captured by having the live action Michael Jordan surrounded by Looney Tunes characters. And, and it's the fault. It's a, it's, a, it's a plight that, that all sequels have, you know, they're, they're almost never guaranteed to be as good as the originals. I mean, there are maybe like, I can count on one hand, how many of the, of, of the sequels I consider to be on par with originals and space jam two just wasn't one of those. It was a fun movie. But Michael Jordan's, you know, choppy movements and choppy acting definitely hindered the entire project. I think the people behind the scenes were very aware of this, which is why they wrote it in such a way where, like, yeah, this will be Michael Jordan's last movie, but we could still do other stuff after this with, like, other genres, other people. And so right. um, I do kind of appreciate that it's not just the Monstars as the villains again, but it's kind of the same concept in that you get this alien character called Berserko. Uh, Berserko is played by, well, he's voiced by Mel Brooks. And, like, he's kind of sillier, like, not as, like, furious or angry as the Monstars could get at times. So it's kind of a different brand of, like, villainy like he he, he kind of reminded me of um gene hackman like Luther at times just like how silly he'd be in like his demeanor you know kind of chaotic in nature rather than demonic <laughs> yeah <laughs> if, i mean the, the the thunderstorm that you know befell the monsters and the way that they treated the looney tunes characters when they were you know juiced up that's not quite the the approach that Berserko takes in this film. He he's he seems to be more interested in in 
disrupting the status quo that is Looney Tunes land. You know, they they have their ways, they have their their approaches, they have their their you know antics and whatnot. And Berserko just seemed more set on disturbing life there, finding ways to make things different and uncomfortable for his own personal gain, of course. You know, I think the Gene Hackman uh, uh, comparison is very, very accurate. Like, there were things that Berserko was trying to do that was for his own personal interest, but also for the interest of just disturbing life in Looney Tunes land. Yeah, it's funny because if you just read his name on paper, it's like, oh, Berserko, that sounds like a monstrous type of villain. But like an explosion or something. Like, he's yeah. going to go berserk on us. Yeah. Yeah. But, like, he has, like, he looks kind of like, um, he's dressed kind of like a superhero and that he has, like, a cape and, like, a big O and an exclamation point on his shirt. Uh, he has, like, a hat with, like, a third eye on it and it's like it just looks really silly and basically yeah like his motivations are different in that he just he he's just doing it for the lulls he's not like trying to get more customers at a theme park or whatever like the aliens in the first movie but like he has like his own minions and he's just like yeah i just want to stir trouble in looney tunes land where are you gonna do about it nee, 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 nee. And it kind of fits, like, that classic Looney Tunes humor, I yes. guess, and just how ridiculous it is. Yes, but I think part of what ended up hampering this movie again was perhaps it was a little too similar, perhaps a little too on the nose. You know, instead of looking at this as a, as a potential Space Jam movie, which had kind of set the tone for, like, there being some sort of crisis that they have to resolve – it felt more like just a giant extended Looney Tunes episode. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, it felt very within the realm of possibility to have some alien creature come into your world. It was almost like Marvin Martian, you know? And instead of trying to blow up the Earth, it was this, this out-of-this-world character who was just trying to disrupt life in Looney Tunes land. You know, it, it makes me wonder just how they were able to find a way to justify bringing Michael Jordan back just for some sort of essential grudge match against Berserko, you know? Like, what kind of competitive edge were they really trying to achieve in this? Uh, I, I, I feel like there, there was a, a little bit missing in there that they, they could have expanded upon if they had found a way to raise the stakes just a little bit higher in that basketball game. Yeah, and, like, it starts off with a basketball game, but, like, Berserko is like, oh, we're not going to do just a basketball game. We're going to do baseball, golf, we're going to do it all. Because, like, I guess the people making this movie really wanted to go big or go home. And it's like, how do you do a sequel to, like, the greatest basketball movie of all time, uh, arguably? Like, I honestly don't know what other basketball movies there are so uh don't oh, there's, me on that <laughs> oh there's plenty oh dude there's plenty hoosiers first comes to mind and then there's one about a, a team from texas that wins the college basketball championship called glory road it's a disney film it's on disney plus oh i think really, i may have seen that one actually it's really really good like not not to distract from the conversation too much but anytime i get a chance to talk about that movie i will because that school that they made this movie on was the first school to have five black players starting in a national championship game. Their starting lineup was all black, black players, and that was the first time that had been done in championship game history. So oh, that's really cool. It was it was a really cool movie to watch as they like came together and, and learned how to be teammates with each other, even in a really, really racist part of Texas. Like it was it was it was it was a really interesting timepiece. And so that's one of my personal favorite basketball movies. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I saw this in the theater. Like yeah, like, like I vaguely remember it and yeah, I probably didn't appreciate it as much at the time, but 
Yeah, from the sounds of it, it sounds like it did a good job of being what it was trying to be. From from what I understand, it's actually pretty historically accurate. Like they went on the campus and like did some research and stuff in order to make it like as on point as possible. And so, yeah, I've got I've got plenty of good things to say about that movie. Probably more than I do about this one because you're right, doing all three sports at once <laughs> and trying to like. <laughs> simultaneously put a basketball in a hoop while also hitting a golf ball up into the stands while, you know, there was just so much chaos going on that it, I mean, Berserko's plan was, was going to perfection because of the chaos, but I mean, it was almost hard for the viewer to, to keep up with, with what exactly was going on, what the score was, what the stakes were. There was a lot of confusion happening during that game. Yeah, there's basically no rules to this game, which, to be fair, the basketball game and the first one, it's like, yeah, they're basically doing things that would be against the rules. Like, you got Elmer and Yosemite Sam, like, shooting at one of the monsters, like, that. Shooting his teeth out, yeah, and then Bugs Bunny (laughs) driving around on a moped, and the the elbows jostling everywhere, and, you know, painting the guy's butt red so that the the bull comes out of the stands and you know spikes him in the butt like that's all just classic looney tunes but still fit within the confines of the premise which was the basketball game as soon as you have you know multiple sports happening at once it was that that was just a whole different type of chaos because golf is supposed to be like an outdoor sport and basketball is supposed to be like an indoor sport and so you know, you had all of these different things in motion at once. And at least for me personally, I just kind of gravitated towards one particular sport and like just kind of turned off my attention to the other ones until the camera started shifting back to that sport. You know what I mean? Like for a little while, there'd be focus on basketball for a little while, there'd be focus on golf. And like they tried to tell you which things to pay attention to, but I just seem to always end up watching like one particular sport whenever I watch the movie. So like first watch, I'm watching the basketball stuff. The next watch, I'm keeping up with the golf stuff and so on and so forth. Because trying to keep up with all three at once is almost impossible. Yeah, you can imagine that people went back lots of times for that reason, like like that and the memory racing thing. And the memory racing. Yeah, that didn't, that didn't help much. It's like, what just what did yeah. I just watch? I don't know. Do you mean literally or or metaphorically? (laughs) Yeah, I I do agree that it was chaos, but it did provide some opportunity to bring in, like, some interesting guests, which uh, I I probably didn't appreciate these uh, celebrity appearances as a kid, but, like, I get them now, like, as an adult. Uh, so for the baseball portion, they th- this happens like before they get Michael Jordan, right? They're trying to they send someone to like get him, and what then they come back and they're like, "Wait, Michael Jordan? I thought you said Michael Dorn." And you see Michael Dorn dressed as Worf, wearing the baseball outfit that he wears in Deep Space Nine, because like oh they were making goodness. that episode around that time. So it's like, oh um, my goodness, like Daff- Daffy was like. He looks like something out of Star Trek. And that's a line from the first movie from one of the basketball players. I thought mm-hmm. that was kind of funny. Yep. Yep. I, I remember that. And I re- actually remember that episode, Take Me Out to the Hollow Suite. And that was that was an eclectic episode, but also turned out to be a classic. Because now you yeah. can actually <laughs> get, like... Niners jerseys online like you can buy the shirts and the hats online as like collectors items memorabilia so to to have them on the on the on the movie was quite an accomplishment as far as cooperation between franchises to get you know Worf in the full makeup and and everything get him there for for just a cameo that was that that was probably expensive now that I think about it but you know, back then I wasn't watching Deep Space Nine, so it, it's kind of fun to go back and catch some of that stuff that that I didn't catch the first time around. You're right. Yeah, because there was a rivalry between Deep Space Nine, which was like Paramount, CBS, whatever, and um, Babylon Five, which is Warner Brothers. Because yep, but like 
it's possible that the Babylon 5 premise may have been taken during pitch meetings and that became DS9. And like there are some similarities, but you can enjoy the differences between each show like very much. Like I appreciate that we have both shows to watch and they're like enjoyable in their own right, in their own context. Um, but yeah, this was like a really good, like it was sort of like a burying the hatchet type of thing. At least that's what it felt to me watching it as an adult. And it's like, yeah, they'll have Michael Dorn like playing in the baseball game and i thought it was funny when he's like uh i was just acting i don't know how to play baseball that well and so like sometimes he would miss and other times he would like hit the ball accidentally and like do a home run and it's, it was just fun seeing that anything michael dorn is in i'm gonna watch <laughs> you know <laughs> like loved him in star trek and did you know that he actually had small roles in the uh, Jim Henson Productions show Dinosaurs. Oh, did he? Yeah. Like, y you don't always see him, obviously, because it's like the, the, the animatronic characters. But he'll voice different dinosaurs or, like, elders or, like, do voiceovers being, like, their version of God and stuff like that sometimes. And so, yeah, he was he was pretty involved in the Dinosaurs franchise when it was around, too. Yeah, I watched that show like a year and a half ago on Hulu and it's like I loved it. I love how it's like they were able to insert stuff that was sort of a reflection on like like basically social commentary and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But also like the way I found out about the show, it was like a few years before I actually watched it was the notorious ending which like, I don't know how that got approved, but it's, like, kind of sad, but also kind of funny to me. I don't know if that makes me sound like a terrible person, but, like, just that they were able to end it the way that it ends. Like, it's, yeah. Go watch Dinosaurs, listeners. <laughs> yeah, seriously. I mean, it's, it's on Disney+, Plus, so it's it's worth the watch. I I have been hesitant to bring myself all the way to the conclusion because of that very reason. Like, <laughs> I just, I just want to keep enjoying it because you're right they did like an episode on marijuana they've done an episode on peer pressure they do episodes on you know just just these weird dinosaur traditions like hurling day and stuff like that like oh my gosh so many laughs from that or show. there's the episode where the dad becomes um he becomes a superhero and it's like i forget what his superhero name was it's like mr it's not Mr. Superior. It's Mr. Something. I don't know. It's I don't know if I got yeah. to that episode yet. Okay. Yeah. It might I've be been, a later episode, but I've been yeah. I've been I've been bouncing around between that show and other shows just to kind of extend or prolong the inevitable, which is probably what they did with uh, with Space Jam Two. Here was like you knew eventually how this was going to play out, but they just kept like stretching it for what it was worth and turned it into like an hour and 40 minutes of something that they probably could have done in a half hour if they really really tried hard enough <laughs> yeah ba basically the way that um michael jordan stretched his arm at the end of the first movie like it felt like yeah. even more of a stretch than that yeah yeah that is true because i mean when you when you look at what they can do with with animation and stuff you know, obviously in the in the 90s, Tiger Woods was at his peak in the golf world and they were talking about, you know, getting some sort of tiger to help them. And lo and behold, you don't get a Tiger Woods. You get a Tony the Tiger cameo on the golf <laughs> side of things. And you're like, whoa, wrong tiger. But yeah, <laughs> I mean, he's athletic enough that he still kind of, you know, helped out a little bit, but probably not as much as Tiger Woods would have. But. Yeah, so, like like earlier, you see Michael Jordan golfing with Tiger Woods, and then you're like, "Oh, is Tiger Woods gonna help later on?" But nope, it's Tony the Tiger. <laughs> and and it was like that shot was great. <laughs> I just lost it. I was like, "No, <laughs> you can't be serious." But again, being able to to do things like that was uh, basically how this movie got made. I mean, product placement was just all over the place in this movie and was just like sometimes banging you over the head with it like okay we get it frosted flakes helped sponsor this movie but like 
it that was right up there with like the the, the Walmart product placement that they did with another Looney Tunes film. It wasn't Roger Rabbit, was it? It was it was it, it might have been Rod, Roger Rabbit or it might have been a different one. But there there's one Looney Tunes live action movie where they basically do a whole advertisement for Walmart. And oh yeah, that was in Looney Tunes back in action where they see it? the mirage of the Walmart and it's yes. like, is that mirage or product placement? They're like they're expecting yes. it. Yes, exactly. Exactly. We got more of the same with that with things like Tony the Tiger representing Frosted Flakes. Like just so obvious that it just becomes comical. Yeah, and I mean, even in the first Space Jam movie, you get that part where Stan, play, played by Wayne Knight, is like, he he goes to Michael Jordan and he's like, get get your get your um whatever brand of shoes he's wearing, and it's like, we'll get you some Gatorade, McDonald's, and we'll pick them up at something. So, I don't know the whole line, but it basically like advertises like half a dozen different things in one yep. sentence. Yeah, and it, it's something that I didn't notice as a kid, but watching it as an adult, I was like, that's hilarious. Yep. And where do we stand? Like, like that was my introduction to Wayne Knight. Like, this was long before oh. I saw Seinfeld. And so, like, I knew Wayne Knight as Stan from Space Jam. And when I saw him in Jurassic Park a little while later, I was, like, kind of terrified to see him eaten by one of the raptors or whatever. I was like, hey, why are they eating Stan? It's And, <laughs> like, my brother, my brother had to tell me later on that, like, Oh, uh, in the third movie, they get all the dead people out of the dinosaurs' stomachs, or or they're not dead or whatever. Like they come back to oh. life. Or I don't know. <laughs> nice little white lie in order to get you to watch the movie. <laughs> yeah, I probably. tell you though, dude. Like Wayne Knight was the king of the nineties. Like, yeah. like, like to to be in Jurassic Park, to be in Space Jam. To be uh, voicing Al in Toy Story Two, uh, to to be uh, in to in Seinfeld, and then he was voice. Officer. He was also Officer Don in Third Rock from the Sun. So, like his appearances in the '90s are probably unmatched to anyone else's. Yeah, he even voiced Zoot in that My Favorite Martian movie that I had on VHS as a kid. Oh, really? Yeah, it, it hasn't aged well, I'll be honest, but it was something. Do you remember the Buzz Lightyear of Stark Man animated series? Oh, I love that. That was a good show. Like, low-key, that was a really good show. They did a 70-minute feature film to kind of introduce you to the franchise, and uh, Evil Emperor Zerg was voiced by Wayne Knight in that little 70-minute feature. Yeah, that's... Oh, okay, this is kind of a tangent, but kind of related. But <laughs> just today, um, I mean, we go on tangents all the time on this podcast. Um, so my enough. friend Greg, who has co-hosted on a few episodes this season, he and I are in the Discord chat for a sci-fi and horror society. Mm -hmm. And someone called him, because he's the president of that club, and like someone called him evil emperor gerg because we nicknamed him gerg because of like a typo at some point um and so like someone made like the evil emperor zerg logo but changed it so that it said gerg and so like that was just a highlight of my morning <laughs> that's funny that is funny yeah i can probably quote that entire 70 minute feature length film because my brother watched it like endlessly when it first came out he loves buzz lightyear he loves adventure stories like that like that was that was his jam back in the day uh i see what you did there <laughs> this is a different type of space jam <laughs> uh -huh. exactly see it all comes full circle yeah I think I, I saw that 70-minute movie before watching Toy Story 2, actually. So, but, yeah, like, I, oh, yeah. Content, I, I just love totally Toy be Story. lost on you at that point, then. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, I I vaguely knew of Jesse and Bullseye because of commercials, but yeah. I didn't, like, actually watch Toy Story 2 until, like, a short while after watching that 70-minute movie, which... 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I found that whole series on uh, DVD on, on eBay. It's part of my disc collection now. Oh, nice. Yeah, they need to put that on Disney Plus because I've Agreed. kind of been wanting to go back and watch it. So, but I'm also like watching a ton of other stuff right now. So right, and I'm also <laughs> I'm also still in school, and I'm also working, and you know I got like family obligations, and you know this other weekly program that I do, this other bi-weekly program that I do. It's as if I didn't you know, didn't have time for it or something. Right. Also, the superhero name that um, Earl Sinclair and Dinosaur gets uh, is Captain Impressive. Like, like, that was, like, really bothering me, so I'm glad I finally <laughs> found that. <on> the... <laughs> you went online and did the search. <laughs> yeah, I found it on this site called the Superhero Wiki. <laughs> <laughs> Earl Sinclair is listed on a superhero wiki. Yeah, for that one episode where he becomes oh, a superhero. No. Yeah, I'll, I'll link it in the show notes. Oh, no. But um, but yeah, I like that they brought back Wayne Knight for Space Jam 2. Like, I kind of felt sorry for him in the first movie, kind of being the butt of all the jokes. But here, I kind of appreciated that he was the one giving the Looney Tunes a pep talk every now and then. And, like, they were actually, like, believing him. And, like, yeah, he kind of scored a couple dunks and, like, uh, even got a hole-in-one at one point. And so I, I did kind of like that, even if the quality of the movie wasn't up to par with the first movie. Oh, up to par. Yes, <laughs> sports puns. Uh no, that was that was good. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't. I still feel kind of on the fence about this because part of what made Space Jam one so funny was the fact that Wayne Knight's character was, you know, enthusiastic but overall generally useless. <laughs> like. I don't know how to feel about him actually being somewhat useful in this film. Like, is is he the, the, the foil? No, he's not. He's useful. Who became the foil? Nobody, really. Like, it, it, it was... It was encouraging to see that, you know, they actually did something with Wayne Knight's character, but at the same time, Stan, in my mind, had always just kind of been the butt of the joke. And... And, you know, I, I mean, yeah, they used Daffy as the butt of the joke a couple of times, but, you know, overall, it, it, it was like they were trying to apologize for things they did in the first movie that they didn't really need to apologize for. Yeah, I kind of get what you mean. I don't know. I, I guess they felt like maybe they needed someone to pick up the slack. Acting-wise is what I mean. <laughs> well, okay. Okay, I thought you meant athletically, and I'm like, dude, we're doing three sports now instead of just one. Stan sucked at one sport. What's going to make him any better at the other two? But, I mean, I guess he could be the catcher. I don't know. I, I, I Don't get me wrong. I love Wayne Knight. I, like, I, I will praise him for his work in the 90s all day long. Um, I just think maybe they took him a little too far out of his element in this one. And... I'm not saying that that was what contributed to this show being or this this movie being so different from the first one, um, but I don't know if it necessarily helped it either. Yeah, that's fair. Thankfully, Michael like kind of gets out of his funk in universe when like Lola like slaps him in the face and is like, "Look, you are the athlete here. You need to be top of your game," and like basically gives him, like, the motivational speech, like, stop being so tired and down on yourself. Like, yeah, you'll, was, ret you'll retire someday, but for now, we need you. In, he in was almost, games. like, feeling sorry for himself or something. Yeah, it's it's really odd. I, I, I know that it's because of, like, real-life stuff. Like, yeah, he's considering leaving the, like, retiring from basketball, which gets written into this, but... Mm -hmm. I mean, he could have at least put a little bit more effort into it, like bring back some of that acting magic, which I mean, I mean, I guess because of this, they felt like they needed to bring in other 
acting talents. Like, for example, they brought back Bill Murray again, because why not? And they also brought in Will Smith, because the Looney Tunes are like, we saw him playing basketball in Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, so maybe he'll, he'll do us some good, too. And so... Yeah, like I do love Will Smith, so I, it was fun seeing him in this. But you could tell it was because, like Michael Jordan wasn't feeling up to the task, like acting wise. So they needed someone else who is um, very charismatic to sort of balance things out, I guess. Well, and and that's what's interesting about this movie is there's probably more live action mocap that happens in this one than what you had in the first one because like predominantly michael is the only one until bill murray shows up at the very very end like predominantly in looney tunes land there's only one human and they throw in like three or four of them uh in in this film which was which was pretty clever but i can only imagine that that must have been pretty expensive too like this budget was definitely larger than the previous one that they had and, and uh, it it definitely showed, like they they definitely tried to to up their game as far as the animation and the integration and stuff like that was concerned. But I mean, it was a pretty tall task to try and get all of the different Looney Tunes characters interacting with all of these different actors too. Like Bill Murray spent most of his time on the golf course, which is understandable. And Will Smith spent a lot of his time kind of playing off of MJ on the on the basketball court. Um, so, I mean, they, they kind of delegated the roles a little bit, but still seemed like a pretty big undertaking. And I was pleasantly surprised by how well they were able to put all that together. Yeah. And, like, I don't know, this is like such a wild movie like having all these guest stars together and but again like some sometimes the product placement gets very annoying like when people in the crowd are like hey let's drink some mountain dew or like you you see a yeah. toyota truck drive through the game for like no reason and it's like all these things like there's just so much going on you know i mean what what wasn't one of the the pre-game snacks a Krispy Kreme donut box or something like that? Yes, it was. Like, there was also like a Starbucks cup too. Oh, so, <laughs> so they did it before Game of Thrones did it, huh? Is that what yeah. you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh. Game, of, Game of Thrones ripped off Space Jam 2. That's, yes, that's yeah. a, that's exactly how it <laughs> happened. Uh, I, think, I think one of my other favorite uh favorite moments was, was there was this there was this one gag that happened where they they got so they got so frustrated with the way the golf game was going they decided to fire a bowling ball out of a cannon and got a hole in one that way just by creating a crater right near where the flag was on the green <laughs> like they, yeah. instead, <laughs> instead of swinging it it's just going to be fire in the hole and they just freaking fired a bowling ball right at the hole. And I was like, see, that's what I would do if I was mad at a golf game. And it was it was just the, the timing of it and the, the zaniness of it. Just classic Looney Tunes. Yeah, I mean, you had Wiley Coyote chasing after the Roadrunner in that moment. And so, like, when the bowling ball fired, like, he got caught in the crossfire. And it's like he essentially became the creator. So, you know, just classic Looney Tunes stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, oh. I also thought it was funny when they were trying to think of other players who could potentially help them. And someone was like, what about the Iron Giant? And they're like, he's not done being animated yet. And then they insert an ad for the Iron Giant movie that was coming out later. Oh, which, man. Which, uh, so the me of that other universe says that there wasn't much marketing for the Iron Giant movie over there. But over here, like, this, like, marketing in Space Jam 2 alone, like, boosted, like, the box office for the Iron Giant. So, I guess there's that, like, corporate synergy. I guess it worked. But, yeah, I, I remember that. He, like, it, it was like a frame, almost, of the Giant. Like, it wasn't, it's, it's completely rendered format. 
and he just came stomping down off of a volcano that was to the right of the golf course. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, we're playing golf. And then, you know, just, you know, two miles away is Mount Vesuvius over there. Like, <laughs> what's happening? Yeah. And you also get, like, Batman and Superman from the, like, animated shows that were going on in the 90s. Like, they finally show up and they're, like, hey, people Batman with... and the animated series was badass, dude. Yeah. They're like, hey, we have capes, and Berserko has a cape, so we might have a chance. And, of course, Berserko is, like, trying to cheat by, like, using a fog machine to, like, cloud everyone's vision. But, like, having Batman and Superman on the Looney Tunes team, like, the Toon Squad, like, it gave them an advantage. And, again, it's, like, the Warner Brothers properties. Like, they're basically pumping everything into this movie. Yeah, and and that may have been part of its downfall, and why we didn't get a Space Jam 3 was not just because Michael Jordan probably wasn't interested in doing anything more, but maybe they tried a little too hard in this movie. Like, too big, too fast? Maybe. Maybe just a smidge. Like, oh, hey, basketball worked really good last time. Here's everything! <laughs> Like they, it was like they just threw everything they could possibly find into this movie, and it just became like a, like a like a cluster of cameos and Looney Tunes gags and Warner properties and just everything you could think of. I'm trying to think of like what movie, like what if there was a modern movie that did something like that recently? Because I feel like there was. Am I thinking of like Ready Player One or something? Maybe. Yes, Ready Player One. Although. To me, that felt natural because, well, I read the book first and, like, the book is honest about what it is. It's, like, this online video game world and, you know, obviously you can have anything in it. So it felt earned in that movie to me. But with Space Jam 2, it feels kind of weird after seeing how, I can't believe I'm saying this, more down-to-earth the first one felt. <laughs> like, it felt more grounded in a way. Um <laughs> And now, like, with this new one that's finally coming out this summer, Space Jam A New Legacy, they're doing the Ready Player One thing again, and they're even going to have the Iron Giant who was in the Ready Player One movie, even though he wasn't in the book. Oh, man. Oh, man. Yeah, it's all coming full circle, dude. That's the way it works. Yeah, cinema just regurgitates everything. Every Eventually, you run years. out of original ideas, and you have to come up with sequels and soft reboots in order to keep making money. That's the and way the crossovers. industry works. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I'm okay with certain crossovers, but I mean, I definitely wouldn't want like a Star Wars and Star Trek crossover. <laughs> right. Like there have been recent crossovers that have been kind of weird. Like the Fast and Furious and Transformers one that I talked about with Greg last week. That was weird. And yeah. Well, okay. On that note, I have heard rumblings that they're also trying to blend Fast and Furious with Jurassic Park. Oh, dude. Okay, so uh, do you care if I spoil the end of Fast X for you? Yeah, go ahead. So there's a post credit scene where, like, it shows a jungle, and then you see, like, the foot of a T-Rex, like, stomp on the ground, and you no. hear the roar. So, I don't know, maybe after dominion there will be like a crossover in like fast 11 or whatever they call it like i don't know i don't know what's going on but we'll see <laughs> oh my gosh i didn't think they had the guts to do that but they went and did it wow yeah. <laughs> wow that's crazy i mean i'm still gonna watch it because dinosaurs you know but yeah uh, i mean we're gonna watch dominion and talk about it when it comes out so yeah <laughs> Oof. I'm going to want in on that conversation. Ooh, yeah. Oh, man. Okay. L let's talk about the, the, the game itself. Because there were some gags that happened interspersed throughout. But the, the game itself, this, particularly the one that, that Michael was playing, you know, you end it so magically on the previous movie with, you know, the buzzer beating arm extension game winning shot. Like, how do you possibly come up with something more magical than that 
to finish off a game against uh, a character like Berserko, who's been throwing, you know, fogs and shadows your direction. He he set up a, a hot dog stand on the golf course in order to draw a crowd right in the middle of where people are shooting. Like, obviously, this guy is just trying to be disruptive. So how do you counteract someone that's just being chaotic and destructive in a way that also lets you feel like you've accomplished something to win the game? Like, that was a pretty pretty big undertaking for, for Michael and just the Space Jam people as a whole, I feel like. Yeah, and you could see, like, in Michael's face, he's like, I'm getting really tired of this stuff. <laughs> like, I mean, in yeah. his face, you could see the expletive in his face, but, you know, it's <laughs> like this is a family movie, so... Yeah, you could see the yeah. expletive in his face and the dollar signs in his pupils. Like, they were the things <laughs> that were, like, keeping him in the balance there. Eventually, he decides, all right, I I'm going to end my basketball career on a high note, and so... We get this like final like part of the game, and what you think of like how this whole thing played out? Like, like it was funny seeing like one of the minions of Berserko throw Porky because like pigs fly, like they make that joke. But like, what you mm -hmm. think of this like final match type of thing? I found it actually pretty interesting. Like, I, I know that I was just criticizing how grand of an undertaking it was, but considering how grand of an undertaking it was, they actually did a pretty decent job with it. Because, you know, in in golf terms, you have to make a really, you have to make a putt, basically. If you don't get the hole in one, but you get it on the green, you've got to make a putt in order to to get it in. In baseball, there's a lot of, of hitting the ball and somebody retrieving the ball in order to try and win the game. And in basketball, obviously, you have to make like shots into the hoop in order to get points. So how do you blend three seemingly different sports into one thing? Well, the answer is very simple. In classic Looney Tunes fashion and just in classic cartoon fashion... You bring all, all of this about with a big musical number. Like, of course, <laughs> there's going to be a song and dance routine. We've had just about everything else in this film. Why not have a, a song performed by Bugs Bunny playing the guitar while there's like this nine piece band going on behind him as he's encouraging Michael to, you know, get this final triumvirate of, of pieces of the puzzle together and What's really weird is with one motion of his arm, and this was this was actually really clever. Like there's this one place, you know, kind of like a like a what is it, a Venn diagram where where all three areas kind of cross over into one. Uh, like there's this one overlap area. You've got the baseball here, you got the 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 golf over here, the basketball over here, and Michael just happens to be standing like right in that center point where everything is kind of transpiring at once. And with one motion of his arm, and, and I still don't really know how they do this because it's like a bunch of animated cut scenes while Michael Jordan is like making a motion uh, with his arm. But in that motion, he's able to like fling up a basketball towards the hoop. He's able to swing a golf club with just the right power that he needs to put it towards the hole. And he's also able to like swing the bat with that same motion. And it's like, as that arm motion is transpiring, he's doing all three different sports in one motion. And as each cutscene transpires, you see him like putting up the game winning shot and, and putting the game winning putt and hitting the game winning home run all in one giant swing of his arm. Like his last heroic piece of athleticism, he just lets it loose all in one fiery motion. And in spite of all of Berserko's efforts, we have to hearken back to the, the final few seconds of the first Space Jam movie where Daffy says... You know, basically anything can happen. This is Looney Tunes land. And it's like, in this moment, Michael remembers that. And instead of, you know, trying to harness 
you know, his his golf skills and his baseball know-how and and his his basketball moxie, even if he's on the verge of retirement. All he has to do is remember two things. Number one, he's an athlete. And number two, he's in Looney Tunes land. And when he puts those two things together at exactly the right time, Looney Tunes land takes care of the rest of the magic. And he finds a way to win it for the Toon Squad in in one fell swoop. And as as much as you have to suspend your disbelief for something like that, it's also just a pretty unbelievable feat of cinematography to get all of that to work together and look right in order to make it look like Michael Jordan is saving the day once again, which he does. So applause to him and applause to Warner because, you know, in spite of every doubt that every person may have had going into this, he freaking does it again. It's so simple, right? You you see the solution at the end of the first movie and then you get to the second movie and it's like, hey, wait, why don't we do the same thing uh, again? And it's like, it could easily feel very, like you could nitpick the fact that they don't try something similar like right away, but the way that it plays out at the end, it's just, it's equal parts hype and hilarious. Like yep. it's so weird. But yep. it's so fitting, and it's just, yeah, like, it, this was the only way they could do it. And and the way they did it was, you know, like I said, in classic Looney Tunes fashion with, you know, a combination of, of outrageous and hilarious, but also, you know, in a, in a classical, you know, cartoony type trope, you got, like, a, a big musical number, the song and dance bit going on triumphant music playing and kind of coming to a crescendo when he makes all of that that game winning motion happen all at once like it, it's classic cartoons it's classic looney tunes and it's it's classic michael jordan and you know they, they put all of that together right when they needed it most when they win the game they confront berserko and are like now you know not to mess with the toon squad and then Berserko is like really he throws like a temper tantrum and and it's like you, you know props to Mel Brooks and like voicing this character. Yeah, and, that's like, one thing we haven't that. talked about very much. I mean, freaking Mel Brooks, man. Like my gosh, I I really only knew him from Spaceballs coming into my rewatch. Like I'll I'll admit Mel Brooks was really wasn't something that I watched a whole lot of growing up, but Oh my gosh, it was almost like they brought Mel Brooks to life in Berserko's character. They literally designed and animated and wrote this character for Mel Brooks, and it wouldn't have worked without him. Yeah, I forgot to mention this, but it's also funny when, like, earlier in the movie, he tries to replace the balls in the game with, like, identical-looking ones that he manufactured. He's like, hey, hey, these are space balls, and basically remote controlling them to his will before he's <laughs> caught and like they get back on track of course cuz you you have to you have to make that type of mention like you can't really get mel brooks into a film and not hearken to some of his previous work like you just can't you have to throw in stuff like that yeah like like even though the works of his i have seen don't really work very much for me i still appreciated that joke and it was like it was very fitting. I appreciate um, I appreciate the effort and the meta humor. Even if I don't appreciate all of Mel Brooks's previous works, I appreciate meta humor. And of course, they do like the classic Looney Tunes thing where they strap Berserko to a rocket and then light up the end of it and just fire him all the way into space to parts unknown. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, why not send Berserko back where he came from? You know, go cause chaos someone else, somewhere else. Wouldn't it be funny if he ended up landing that rocket on Moron Mountain? <laughs> yeah, it just like causes it to be destroyed completely. <laughs> well, I mean, it was already on the verge of collapse before yeah. the first Space Jam movie was done. But he he seems chaotic, but also somewhat capitalistic and maybe he sees Moron Mountain as an opportunity and 
tries to to take it over and turn it into like Berserko World or something. I don't know. Yeah, that might have been fun, but alas. <laughs> We didn't get a Space Jam 3, so I guess we'll never know. <laughs> so before the humans head back to like their world, uh, we see Bill Murray eating a lot of cartoon food. Like He eats like some cartoon pesto, cartoon hot dogs, and stuff like that. And it pretty much sets up like a later scene toward the end where he has to go to the doctor, and they do x-rays on him and see that there's, like, a whole city of, like, blood cells that look like people living in him. And, like, he calls the Ferrelli brothers as, like, you know, I think if we have an idea for a movie. And it's basically a little ad for Osmosis Jones, which was which came out, like, two years after this. Oh, of all things. I didn't even catch that reference. See, the the, the watching through things through the lens as a kid is just totally different from seeing it through the eyes as an adult. That's clever. And so Michael Jordan is happy with this, how the game turned out. And he announces his, like, retirement from basketball. So, you you know, the movie's historically accurate, I suppose. Um, (laughs) As close as you can be, yeah. Yeah, and so we get this nice little scene where he's, like, hanging out with his family, and it's just, like, they have, like, a barbecue in the backyard, which, you you know, hashtag barbecue watch, and, like, Stan Stan comes over uninvited and is like, hey, mind if I have some ribs with you? And he's like, "Uh, this is more of a family thing, but his, like wife and kids are like yeah let's have him here and michael was like yeah okay whatever and so <laughs> yeah and yeah that was like a fun little scene i guess it was almost like an epilogue you know how they do when you know the main story's concluded but you're just not quite ready to say goodbye yet so yeah having a having a family cookout with stan involved it's almost like a symbolic way of saying that stan's part of the family now by having him part of that family cookout. So I I liked that scene. I thought it was cute. And yeah, of course, obviously I'm going to be a fan of barbecue stuff. So um, maybe that's where I got my affinity for barbecue. No, I'm kidding. I'm from Texas. I've always (laughs) loved barbecue. And so like, as the movie is ending, we see that Will Smith is like still hanging out in like animation land or whatever. And he meets like the animated version of his men in black character, um, agent J. He meets, like, the animated version because, you know, the animated series of Men in Black was going on at the time. Right. And then um, the animated uh, version, like, turns to the audience and uses the memory eraser device that the Men in Black use. Yeah. (laughs) There you have it. Next thing you know, you don't even remember watching Space Jam 2. So there it is. Unless you blink like my friend Keon did. (laughs) Oh, wow. So only, only a certain percentage recall actually watching this movie in theaters right and it's just the ones that just happen to blink at the right time what's funny is that there's there's a doctor who episode that tells you don't blink yeah but in <laughs> case of space jam 2 it's like wait for it wait for it wait for it okay blink now yeah i also liked will smith's soundtrack for this movie like you know you had that song that was kind of a hit back in the day but not as much where he's like Watch out for the Toon Squad. They're coming on the court. They're going to beat you at the sport. And yeah, it's kind of an earworm, I guess. But mm. yeah, for basically just cashing in on like the Will Smith hype at the time, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, you kind of have to, especially considering the timeline, you know, late 90s. That's That's kind of like on the rise, Will Smith. And so, it, yeah. Didn't yeah. surprise me that that was that was how they kind of close things out in the credits. Like you know, there's always credits music, but definitely didn't surprise me that you know you finish the movie with Will Smith, you finish the credits with a Will Smith song. Like that part was was unsurprising to me as an adult. I was like, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. That was probably one of the most logical things of the whole movie, honestly. All right, so I guess we could go into final thoughts and score out of 10. Yeah, so what were your final thoughts and score out of 10 for Space Jam 2? Oh, man. 
you know, it's tough for a movie to to follow in the footsteps of the original. And as much as Space Jam 2 tried, it just didn't resonate with me quite the way the first one did. Like the first one is probably like a like a 8, maybe like a 8.5 in that in that area. This one still had its moments like that that final sequence that I was talking about with the the music crescendo and the one swing of the arm kind of interacting with three different sports like the sports fan in me thought that was pretty clever. Um the 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 increased zaniness was was entertaining at times but also like the over the top product placement was also annoying at times. So it was like every time they did something good, they kind of counteracted it with something that I found kind of grating. And so, like, I kept swinging back and forth and back and forth on this movie. But at the end of the day, it's also about how entertained you were by the film. And I was entertained by it. So I, I don't necessarily hate this movie. I feel like there were things about it that could have been better, sure. But... Sequels are just never going to be as good as originals. They're just not. Unless so, they're The Empire Strikes Back. And unless surpassing. it's The Empire Strikes Back or, you know, the, the, the very few... Planet of the Apes movies. Very, very few instances. Yeah, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes was excellent. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, there's there's just, like I said earlier, I can probably name those on, on one hand. They're, they're very few and far between. And so this one, unfortunately, doesn't fall into that category. Um, but in the in the spirit of of hoops, I'll, I'll probably give this one six basketballs out of ten. Wasn't terrible, but wasn't really like over the top amazing either. Yeah, I agree that the first movie I would probably consider in the like a to eight point five range, like. It's not a perfect movie, but it's just fun to watch. Uh, it's I'd be hard pressed to feel tired of watching it. Like if someone were to say, "Hey, let's watch Space Jam," I'd be like, "Oh yeah, sure." Um, whereas if someone were to say, "Let's watch Space Jam 2, I'd be like, eh, I, "I mean, I yeah. guess okay." Like like yeah. it's somewhat yeah, entertaining. I, I'd I'd hesitate more on number two than I would on number one for sure. Yeah, <laughs> you said number two. Yeah, as I said, number two. <laughs> but I do agree that Space Jam 2 was at least somewhat entertaining, even if it didn't reach the heights of the first one. Some of the cameos are more fun to watch as an adult than as a kid, especially when you like finally remember what actually happened in the movie. And so, I, I don't know, Like I, I guess like it's not a terrible movie, but it could have been better, and... Like I've said, Michael Jordan, um, like feeling like he was phoning it in, did take me out of it at times. So I think I'd give this one a six point seven five sticks of dynamite out of ten. Six point seven. So how do you get point seven five sticks of dynamite? Did part of it already blow up in Wiley Coyote's face? <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I, th I think I think that's fair though. I think that's fair. Never, hardly ever. Not gonna say never. Never say never. But hardly ever gets up to par with the with the ones that you saw first. So if I do another rewatch, like I rewatched it for this purpose for tonight. But if I'm if I'm gonna do another jam cinematic universe rewatch, it'd probably be like either the original Space Jam or maybe like Spy Jam. Those are like my top favorites. Yeah, Spy Jam had some stuff to enjoy, but I'll, I'll get there eventually on this podcast. Um, <laughs> One of these days. <laughs> yeah, like the episodes for Spy Jam, Race Jam, and Skate Jam will be interspersed between other things just so you don't have like too much jam consecutively. You so, don't like, want to be listeners. Don't get tired of that. <laughs> you don't want to be jam packed full of those episodes. <laughs> oh man, you are hanging out with me way too much. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say the same thing about you, dude. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, with that, uh, I guess. Zach, thanks again for being on this episode. Where can people find all the stuff you're involved with? 
Yeah, dude. Thanks again for having me. This was this was a fun episode. I like getting to to take a trip down memory lane when I have the opportunity and this kind of helped me remember some of my childhood and some of the reasons why I enjoy the the jam universe uh, as a whole. Um, I'm on basically every social media platform. I've got the same username now. It's Zach the Voice, Z A C H the Voice, all one word, no dots, no underscores, no nothing. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitch, Venmo, all of that. That's all, all Zach the Voice now. So. Uh, you can find me there and then just search for like IPC podcast on Facebook and Twitter. We're probably most active on those two platforms right now. Um, got some big things in the works for the Intergalactic Peace Coalition. Um, as of the time that we recorded this episode, there's a, a big announcement on the horizon and uh, some big stuff happening for our seventh anniversary in May. So exciting times ahead. Yeah, I'm real excited to see what the seventh anniversary thing is because... I talked about this in the like Facebook group, but I had this dream. Uh, I think I've told you guys about this, where like <laughs> you guys were like broadcasting from a backyard, and the episode was gonna be about B movie, and like Ben tells you that he's gonna get the honey, which so like, <laughs> yeah. And then I commented, and I was like, "Damn it, Ben, he guessed it." <laughs> Yeah, so now you have to like change it up to keep the- now. Now we got to do something different now because he, you had a fever dream about it. So who knows? <laughs> uh, I, I, I do feel like we need to do some DreamWorks stuff eventually down the line, and B movies definitely going to be a part of that. Um, but there is there is some some other some other stuff happening uh, on uh, on May the first. Be on the lookout for a big announcement on May the first, and then uh, there'll be more stuff that it comes in after that. But our uh, seventh anniversary episode is going to be on the 14th of May, and that's when the the big thing is going to happen. So follow us on the socials to find out what exactly that is, and uh, be on the lookout for a big announcement on Saturday, May the 1st. Oh, nice. That's actually the day that this episode's coming out, so... Ooh. So go find our socials. Corporate, <laughs> go find corporate out. synergy for the win. <laughs> go 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 find out what's happening. Yeah, it's a pretty big deal. All right, and listeners, if you want to find my stuff, you can follow me at Stephen Schinder on Instagram and Twitter. Stephen Schinder Storytelling on Facebook. You can find my fantasy horror comedy novel Lemons on Mike Rain on Amazon. More info at stephenschinder.com. And you can also find episodes that I've been on um, on Star Trek Culture. It's on the Culture Slate YouTube channel in the playlist section. If you want to email Delayed Replay, you can email Delayed Replay Podcasts at gmail.com. Let us know your thoughts on Looney Tunes or what have you, movies, and we might read your thoughts on the show. And yeah, like, like review subscribe whatever tell your friends tell your enemies tell your family um <laughs> and the next episode will probably be about dr strange and the multiverse of madness but without further delay have a good day <laughs>